Welcome to Electron Line. Here we have an interesting example that will actually apply cross products, the curl of a vector quantity, and related to some real live example. So let's say that we have a solid rotating disk where the axis of the disk is on the z-axis. The disk is rotating with an angular velocity omega. And notice when we write that in a vector quantity, when we curl our fingers in the direction of rotation, our thumb will point in the direction of the vector quantity of omega, so that would be the angular velocity vector pointing in the z direction with magnitude omega, and of course unit vector k in the z direction. The velocity at any point on the disk, let's say at the edge of the disk or some any point on the disk here, is simply going to be equal to the omega, the angular velocity in radians per second, times the distance away from the center of rotation. Now also notice that we can pick up any point on the disk and the directional vector from the origin to that point of the disk, we call that the, the uh, position vector, which can be written as x in the i direction plus y in the j direction plus z in the k direction. And so we can just label any point on the disk as point p. Now we can represent the velocity anywhere on any point on the disk represented by point P as simply the cross product of the angular velocity vector omega with the position vector r. So let's go ahead and calculate that. Notice that in the case of omega we only have one component in the k direction and for the position vector we, we have an x, y, and z in the i, j, and k direction. So let's go ahead and find the cross product of that. So the cross product will be equal to i times, that will be 0 times this, minus omega times y. So that will be omega, oop, I need a minus in there, so minus omega times y, minus j, and so we have this times this, which is 0, minus omega times x, but since we have a minus in there, that will then, of course, cancel out. So we have minus omega times x, and plus the k direction, and in the k direction, of course, notice that we have zero result. So this will be equal to minus omega y in the i direction and plus omega x in the j direction. So this vectorially represents the velocity as a function of the rotational velocity omega and the position xy relative to the xy plane on the disk. So that will give us the vector quantity representing the uh, velocity. Now notice that that will actually represent a vector field going around the axis on the z-axis and so when we take the curl of that we should be able to get a result and that's what we're going to do in just a moment here. In addition to that we're also going to find the magnitude of the velocity at any point right there, any tangential velocity for any point P, and maybe I should just put the sub P there so we don't get too confused here. So for any point P, we can actually find the velocity on that disk by taking the magnitude of the angular velocity times the magnitude of the position vector times the sine of theta. Oh, I don't need that, I guess. Times the sine of the angle theta here, and let's go ahead and see what that is equal to. So the magnitude of a cross product can be calculated like this. That's where that came from. So let's plug in what we have. So it's equal to omega times the magnitude of the position vector. Well, if we use the three-dimensional Pythagorean theorem, that will be equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That will be the magnitude of the position vector times the sine of theta. Now remember, the sine of theta by definition is the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse is indeed the magnitude of the r vector, and the opposite side to the angle is going to be d, so this is going to be times d divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and luckily those two cancel out. You can see then that the moment that the magnitude of the velocity anywhere on the disk is simply going to be equal to omega times d, which is of course what we already discovered over here from previous knowledge. So at least it's nice to see how that matches. And finally, since we can now represent the velocity as basically a curling vector field, 
with larger magnitude near the edge and smaller magnitude near the center of rotation, we should be able to take the curl of that, and the curl then will represent the fact that this is a rotating, as we would call it, vector field. So let's go plug in the value in here for the curl for V, and V is determined to be equal to this. So the X component is going to be minus omega times Y. The Y component, or the J component, is omega times X, and we have zero for the Z component. So let's go ahead and now calculate the curl. So this is equal to I times the partial respect to Y of zero, which is zero, minus the partial respect to Z of this, which is going to be zero as well, and minus the J component, the j component is going to be equal to the partial, of x, the partial respect x of 0, which is 0, minus the partial respect of z of this, which is also going to be 0, so there's no i and no j component, plus the k component, and for the k component, we have the partial with respect x of this, which is going to be omega, minus the partial respect to y of this, which is going to be a minus times a minus omega, like that. So in other words, this is going to be equal to 2 omega in the k direction. So there we go. This then indicates that when we calculate the curl, we do have a representation of a rotating vector field, and that is what the curl tells us. So you can see we have some very nice applications of the cross product and the curl in the case of a rotating disk. It's a nice example, and that's how it's done.